Good afternoon. Oh, that was, that was easier than I thought it was going to be. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Amir Ahmed. I serve as Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at University of Vermont. Thank you for joining us for the 2022 Inclusive Excellence Symposium, an evolution of the Blackboard Jungle Symposium. Uh, we are so thankful for the opportunity to continue to advance this important symposium uh, for the university. Uh, and this year's theme is at the intersection of diversity, equity, inclusion, and sustainability. Uh, we've had a wonderful week with amazing speakers uh, who are helping us think about this important intersection at University of Vermont around diversity, equity, inclusion, and sustainability and its key fundamental connection for the future of our university. This symposium is built to be a professional development space, but we've also made, uh, we've made it available for students as well uh, this year, and we're, we're looking to continue to grow and expand our reach and our impact. I also want to thank everybody here who participated in the 2022 Campus Climate Survey uh, and encouraged other people to participate as well. The data from that survey is going to be used to baseline and benchmark our inclusive excellence strategic planning process going forward. In fact, today, this morning, our senior leadership and our University Diversity Council met together for the first time ever to begin that planning process. And it'll be the first time we've had a data-driven uh, DEI strategic planning process. Uh, and you'll learn more about that in the weeks and months to come. Before I proceed, I want to uh, begin with a land acknowledgement. The University of Vermont is located on the waters and lands which have long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous people for thousands of years and is home of the Western Abenaki people. UVM seeks to honor, recognize, and respect these peoples, especially the Abenaki, as the traditional enduring stewards of the waters and land. With these intentions, we will begin today by acknowledging that the institution of the University of Vermont and many in our UVM community are guests on this land. The institution's role as a guest is to respect the waters, the lands, and the indigenous knowledge interwoven within them and uplift the indigenous peoples and cultures present on this land and within our community. While this land acknowledgement is an essential starting point, there is much work ahead as we come to terms with the legacies and traumas of indigenous dispossession. And you will see, not just today, but tomorrow, our commitment as an institution to, uh, to advance this agenda. Today's keynote is the inauguration uh, of the Wanda Heading Grant Inclusive Excellence Symposium keynote. Uh, and before we have our, yes, yes. And before I welcome Dr. Jane O'Ketch to introduce Dr. Heading Grant, I just need to speak personally how incredibly grateful I am to be an inheritor of her tremendous legacy. Everything that I can accomplish in my role uh, here at University of Vermont is a result of that legacy. And so I do not take it for granted every which way that I benefit from that legacy and I'm eternally grateful, and that is the reason why we will honor her each year as, uh, and name this keynote in her name. To introduce Dr. Heading Grant is Jane O'Ketch, who is a professor and counselor of education and serves as Associate Dean for Academic and Faculty Affairs for the College of Education and Social Services, and soon to be our Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs beginning this summer. Yes, a major accomplishment. Her scholarship primarily focuses on the advancement of proficiencies in the practice of group psychotherapy and clinical supervision with diverse populations. Her body of work has received professional accolades, including recognition with the 2017 Article of the Year Award by the Association for Specialists of Group Work and Dr. Okech's election to, fe to fellow status by ASGW in 2018. She currently serves as associate editor for the J Journal for Specialists in Group Work. Dr. Oketch, I'd love to have you up here to, to honor Dr. Heading Gray.
Hey. Dr. Wanda Heading Grant is the Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Chief Diversity Officer and Distinguished Service Professor of the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. Prior to taking on this new role, Dr. Heading Grant served in multiple senior roles at UVM, from that of Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, to Vice President for the Division of Human Resources, Diversity, and Multicultural Affairs, and Associate Dean of the College of Education and Social Services. Dr. Heading Grant's path to these visible and influential positions started with her experiences as a young black girl growing up in Trenton, New Jersey. She credits her early experiences in Trenton for awakening her awareness of the dynamics of gender and race and its intersection with her aspirations and dreams to transform her life and that of her community. Her experiences as an undergraduate student at UVM inspired her to begin to envision a UVM where students like her could have a sense of belonging, one that could be more diverse, inclusive, and characterized by a socially dynamic learning environment. Whether providing DEI strategic leadership at Carnegie Mellon or UVM, or serving on the board of the United Way or the Vermont Advisory Committee to the US Commission on Civil Rights, or whether hosting a group of faculty at her home or helping organize Burlington's Gospel Fest. A central theme in Dr. Heading Grant's approach to community service, leadership, scholarship, and relationship with students and colleagues alike is interpersonal warmth, consistency, commitment, and authenticity. It is this authentic and warm approach to leadership that makes her a widely known, beloved, and respected change maker a visionary leader who has demonstrated commitment and perseverance in reshaping every organization that she has worked with to become more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Dr. Wada Henning Grant has the unique ability to warm a room, to connect with, and to uplift silenced voices, to make everyone around her feel valued, seen, and heard. It is a trait deeply rooted in her nuclear and extended family of origin. Dr. Heading Grant has accomplished and given so much to UVM, all while raising three lovely children who are now young adults with the support of her husband, Jarvis. I share this abbreviated history to give you a sense of who she is, her incredible story, and her inspiration to found the Blackboard Jungle and to build it from inaugural event in 2008 with 62 participants to more recently a premier event attended by over 500 participants and presenters. Under her leadership, the symposium expanded beyond UVM to one that was attended by faculty, administrators, and students from neighboring institutions of higher learning in Vermont and the Northeast. Blackboard Jungle has served as an annual intellectual hub for dissecting emerging issues of the time related to critical social cultural factors, social justice, and our responsibility to create a more just and inclusive world. It remains one of her most enduring legacies at UVM and Vermont. Dearest Wonder, through your work as a scholar, an administrator, and leader, you have had a significant impact on UVM. Through your strategic vision and activism, you have created a place at the table for those often left behind and contributed significantly to reshaping the narrative of activism, inclusive leadership, and refocused attention where it belongs, the goal of demonstrable, structural, and systemic change for the benefit of all. Your journey at UVM has long cleared and shaped the path that many of us have followed. Your vision of a symposium that provides space for critical conversations around issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and your goal to promote community engagement in critical dialogue around what it means to live in a multicultural, multiracial, and sexually diverse world has come true. In your own words, you have described the impact, the intersectionality of your identity as a mother, sister, wife, friend, community leader, scholar, and administrator have had on your work. 
For over three decades, you planted seeds of knowledge, awareness, and change here at UVM. The crop from those seeds has been harvested. New seeds planted, nurtured as they sprout, grow, and thrive. Your legacy at UVM continues and is an inspiration to us all. I am so proud to call you my friend and sister. <laughs> and so honored to have the opportunity to thank you for your service, work, and legacy here at UVM. Everyone, please join me in giving a big round of applause in acknowledgement of Dr. Wanda Heading Grant's legacy at UVM and the inauguration of the Dr. Wanda Heading Grant Lecture. Welcome. I just told Jane, I'm gonna get her, <laughs> I'm gonna get her. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna get her. God, now you've all made, really made me nervous. <sighs> Jane, thank you so much. Honestly, thank you. You did forget one important thing. You didn't speak about my potato salad. Jane loves my potato salad. <laughs> Jane is like a sister to me. We go back, and there are lots of people who stay in touch, and she's one of them. She's eaten at my home. She's called me for advice. I've called her for advice. I love Jane, and I thank you. I showed up a little upset. I got up at 3.45 this morning to come. And when I got here, there was no music and there was no Sharesh to dance with me. I'm still waiting. I mean, Patty has you beat. We've danced before. So maybe next time. It feels so good to be here with all of you. I think, are there some folks, are they on, is there some live streaming going on? Hey, peeps out there. <laughs> it feels really good. So many hugs, so many people asking me how I'm doing, how's it going, it feels so good. This black African American woman feels seen. I feel seen. And this University of Vermont campus did that for me and is doing it for me now. You know, tomorrow will be one year that I left the University of Vermont and went to Carnegie Mellon University. I really like it there. I really, really do. But I really love it here and I love you all. I'm sure I will love it there as well at some point. They treat me well. I'm always talking about how well you all treated me. <laughs> I hold you up as the standard of how you treated me. I can't speak to any about anyone else. I just know I feel good when I come here. So yes, my journey started at 3.45 a.m. I was not going to miss this. I worried a lot whether I would snore on my two flights, because I do snore, at least my family tells me. I don't know, I think I fell asleep and I was here. So, I feel humbled, I feel grateful, I feel loved, I really do. 
I was talking and sharing. I, had the, I have the unfortunate history that my mother and my grandmother passed away at a very young age, 47 and 52. And there was a time that I didn't think that I would make it to the age that I am. And I think about my mother standing here because she drove me here for the first time. We got lost. And I think she would be very proud that I decided that I wanted to be different. And when I said I wanted to be different, some of you have heard the story, it was I didn't want to go to school in New Jersey and I didn't want to go to school in the South. Not because there was anything wrong with going to school in New Jersey or going to school in the South. It was because I grew up in New Jersey and I spent my formative years in the South during the summer. When we said we were going on vacation, it was in the clay rolls of Georgia. And my mother was from the deep south of Georgia and my father is from Mississippi. And um, my guidance counselor at the time went to St. Mike's and he said, you really want to be different. I didn't get into the University of Vermont. We're going to get you into the University of Vermont. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but I came. I sometimes will wonder about it being bittersweet. Gosh, it's sweeter every day. It's sweeter every day. How do I thank you, Amir, for seeing me? You didn't have to see me. Thank you so much for seeing me. I feel honored. I'm gonna be talking about this a lot. In this moment, somebody get on my nerves. I'm going to say, don't you know what's in my name? Watch out. I'm telling you. Because I'm going to tell them, you know, you need to read what Dr. Ketch wrote right there. But I don't want to hold things up. I want you to know that I'm so honored. It is here that I walk down the street with James Baldwin. It is here that I drove. Uh, Angela Davis around twice. It is here that I cooked for B.B. King's orchestra three times. They said, do you know anybody you know how to make soul food? That's me. He gave me $100 for my sweet potato pie. <laughs> there are things that happened to me and for me here. Of course, they weren't always, always great. But I have taken those and made them great, if not greater, because I have dedicated my life, even when I did not know it, to justice and equity and access, and so on and so on. This is beautiful. I love the Blackboard Jungle Symposium. I love its evolution as an inclusive excellence symposium. I even love it more because my name is associated <laughs> with it. So as I take my seat, I don't, I, my, I didn't put my glasses on, um, I should, but I'm looking back and I see them. And I see over here, and I see this gentleman over here, Dr. Smith, and I see my posse back there, Reverend Laura, Melissa, Kate, and the queen. I like to call her Beverly. You have to know I stand here because folks like them help me be who I am, and I am so grateful. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sherwood. Thank you, Amir. And absolutely, I don't think that this is possible without you supporting it. Thank you, Sharesh. And I'm here for both of you, Patty and Sharesh. Thank you. Wow, 
I knew it was going to be emotional, but wow. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, um, I have been a guest speaker at this symposium and a guest keynote, partially because of Dr. Wanda Heading Grant, so um, prior to my time of actually joining the university. So um, although I don't feel it to the same depth of I, as I know many of you do, uh, I do feel um, just how important of a moment this is. And so, so thank you, uh, Dr. Heddenkamp, for, for coming, uh, to, be, uh, to be willing to be honored. I also have the honor to, of introducing our 27th president of the University of Vermont, President Suresh Garimela. A strong proponent of public higher education, President Garimela leads UVM with firm emphasis on its status as a land-grant university for University of Vermont and the unwavering belief in the transformative power of education and research. Prioritizing access and student success, President Gar Garimela has acted for UVM's students and their families by freezing tuition for four consecutive years. His strategic vision likewise promotes UVM's distinctive research strengths in healthy societies and healthy environment and has driven a 44% increase in external research support in the last two years. A highly cited scholar and researcher and a passionate educator and mentor, Dr. Gary Mella has made seminal contributions to the field of electronic thermal management and micro and nanoscales and in sustainable energy systems technology and policy. So he's a good fit for our theme this week. Dr. Gary Mella has served as Jefferson Science uh, Fellow at the U U.S. Department of State, and he is a member of the National Science Board, which oversees the National Science Foundation. President Gary Mella came to Vermont from Purdue University, where he was a Goodson Distinguished Professor and Executive Vice President for Research and Partnerships. Dr. Gary Mella has earned his PhD from U UC Berkeley, uh, his MS from Ohio State, the Ohio State University, my home state, uh, and his bachelor's degree from the Indian Institute of Technology of Madras, President Gary Mello. Thank you, Omer. I have one complaint. Don't ever schedule me after Jane and Wanda. <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you come back from that? And before Majora, for that matter, I think we are in for a treat. It's great to see a full room, masks, no masks. It's been too long. Welcome everyone, faculty, staff, students, and the broader community that's here with us and joining uh, on streaming. <clears throat> I'm just so pleased to join you here at this inclusive, excellent symposium. First, of course, a special thank you to my friend Wanda for all her contributions over the decades to the diversity, equity, and inclusion at the university and then really more broadly in the state. I really think, Wanda, that you help the state think about it and you challenge the state, you encourage the state, you inspire our community. An event like this keynote is clearly a fitting tribute to your tireless work and the lasting impact you've had. I think in a few years, everything at UVM will be named for you. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, I, I, was, I was talking to Ms. Carter earlier, and, um, and she said, everyone seems to love this Wanda. Yes, 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 it's true. I think you're right in what you're feeling. So there is just very deep um, acknowledgement of what Wanda's done. And, and, and her family, I, I hope, is I hope you know how much and how widely she's loved. This symposium, as you heard from, I believe Jane said, um, started a while back um, in 2008, and Wanda's passion led it from being a sort of a professional development thing for faculty to a community event, uh, something that was on the Vermont calendar that everybody looked forward to. And I'm just pleased that it's evolving to something even greater that perhaps the nation will be looking at and, and forward to. So thank you all for participating over time. If you've got ideas for us, please provide them. Um, the series, of course, was created to look at emerging approaches, and they are emerging all the time, for addressing justice and equity and inclusive excellence. 
both inside and outside the classroom. Uh, so it's an opportunity for exchanging ideas and also for providing tools for our faculty and, and, and such to, uh, how do we enhance our students' education in this space? So that's the fundamental goal, although of course it's grown to be so much more. This symposium, our annual Martin Luther King Jr. events, and we had a great one this time, our vibrant identity centers, the Posse, I think you called it, Wanda. I, I love the leaders there. And our curricular diversity requirements. All of these form a tapestry, in my mind, that helps us with defining and, and preparing our students and our community for thriving in a multicultural society, in a society that's changing so rapidly in front of our eyes. Uh, and, 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 and I hope it's helping us be better stewards of a, of a just, a vibrant future. And I, you have my commitment that I will remain, I, I will do all I can for that. I'm also happy to report a little bit of progress on the national front, and this um, transitions to what we're gonna hear about today. Um, in my role as uh, a member of the National Science Board, uh, and uh, so it, it, it provides science and technology policy advice to the President and, and Congress. I also chair its Committee on Strategy, so I've, I've had the pleasure of driving a few things along with my colleagues, and we are focused, what's, what's relevant to this conversation is that we're focusing on inspiring what we're calling the missing millions. Folks across urban and rural parts of the country that are underserved, that are underrepresented, that are not thinking about higher education. How do we inspire them? How do we bring them into, the, into this um, gift, essentially, this thing which will help them improve their lives, but also help improve the life of the nation? So that's a big priority for us. A second priority that we've been defining and, and trying to grapple with is expanding what we call the geography of innovation. Innovation doesn't need to, be, to happen just on, you know, in Boston and in Raleigh-Durham and in Silicon Valley and such, and actually doesn't just happen there. There are many other places there are innovative things going on, so how do we expand the opportunities, the impact um, all across the country? And so you'll hear more about this, you'll see the federal government focusing on this. It will be a, it'll take a village to get us there, or the nation, or, or, or whatever metaphor you want. Um, we really want to spread this equ equitably across the country. And closer to home, I'm teaching a class this semester um, where we're trying to uh, work with students to uh, have civil discourse across difficult topics, across topics that people don't agree on. And, and one topic has been environmental justice uh, in the context of uh, sort of the push for green energy. So that too, I think, relates. And so I'm, I'm particularly excited um, I know that our speaker today cares about this expanding the geography of innovation and economic development and these kinds of things, so I'm particularly excited about that. Um, I don't think of inclusive excellence as an aspiration. I hope none of us does. I think of it as a necessity. And events like today's are part of our effort to achieve inclusive excellence, both words being very important. So my special thanks to Vice Provost Amar Ahmed, and his team, and to the many others. I know a lot of people have been involved and worked hard to make this symposium possible. I now call on Dr. Bindu Panikar of our Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks, President Garimala. One day, Majora Carter was running with her dog in her neighborhood in the South Bronx. When her dog pulled her into a weedy vacant lot, the lot covered in trash and an illegal dumping site was a waterfront property on the Bronx River. Carter immediately saw its community building potential and started working 
on creating a new park. It's a true story. Creating beauty, healing, and growth right in our neighborhood comes naturally to Majora Carta. Carta's list of accomplishments is long. She's a real estate developer, urban revitalization strategy consultant, MacArthur Fellow, and Peabody Award-winning broadcaster. She currently serves as Senior Program Director for Community Regeneration at Groundswell, Inc., and is author of the best-selling book, Reclaiming, Reclaiming Your Community, a copy of which is at the entrance. Please don't forget to grab one as you go out. Carter applies her corporate consulting practice focused on talent retention to reducing brain drain in American low-status communities. She's responsible for the creation of numerous economic development programs, technology inclusion, and green infrastructure projects, and job training and placement systems. Carter's experience creating Thriving mixed-use local economies started in South Bronx, but she did not stop there. She is now a leader in the world of sustainable business. Her approach helps to increase wealth building opportunities and produces long-term fiscal benefits for governments, residents, and private real estate developments throughout North America. Maybe UVM can use her services as well. <laughs> She's also creative and versatile in her approach to building community. For example, in 2017, she launched the Boogie Down Grind, a hip hop themed specialty coffee and craft beer spot, and the first commercial third space in the Hunts Point section of the South Bronx since the mid-1980s. The venture also provides a rare opportunity for local families to invest through SEC-approved online in investment platforms. I cannot wait uh, to visit uh, the boogie down grind. Uh, really have to check it out. <laughs> All this aside, I know Carter as a prominent environmental justice activist. Carter's definition of environmental justice is that no community should be saddled with more environmental burdens and less environmental benefits than any other. This powerful definition has been used widely in our own work on environmental justice here in Vermont, especially to introduce our first environmental justice policy for the state, which just passed the Senate this Tuesday. And it's headed, <laughs> um, yes, it, it did pass this Tuesday, and it's headed to the House. Uh, we've been working towards this bill for the past four years and are thrilled by its recent progress. It is an important time for environmental justice in Vermont, and so a truly appropriate time to have Carter here to share her wisdom. <laughs> I hope this bill, known as S-148, will lead to a major sustainable community development in the most underserved communities in Vermont, mirroring the work Majora has done throughout her life. <laughs> this is, um, there is often a misconception that to fight for the environment, you need a national park or a plot of pristine nature to protect. Carter has shown that we should fight for and reclaim our own communities. Carter is a modern sustainability icon for her work, taking back the rights to her community's land 
and for fighting against environmental and socially unjust situations. All of her achievements build from her first park initiative and her desire to better her community. Carter is quoted on the walls of Smithsonian Museum of Ameri African American History and Culture in DC with her words, nobody should have to move out of their neighborhood to live in a better one. Her ability to shepherd projects through seemingly conflicted socioeconomic currents has garnered her eight honorary PhDs and awards, such as 100 Most Intriguing Entrepreneurs by Goldman Sachs, Silicon Alley 100 by Business Insider, uh, Liberty Medal for Lifetime Achievement by News Corp, and other honors from the National Building Museum, International Design Association, Center for American Progress, as well as her TED, TED Talk, one of the six to launch that site in 2006. Impressive work indeed. Um, she's clearly a superstar. Um, I feel um, like we are in the presence of greatness today. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Wanda Heading Grant, uh, then uh, Dr. Jano Ketch, and now we have um, Majora Taylor. Um, it's really a privilege uh, to stand on what they have built and to have their guidance. Um, Friends, um, it's my honor to invite Majora Carter on to stage to mark this Inclusive Excellence Symposium with her keynote address. Thank you. Dr. Wanda. Okay, before I saw, I just have to say this, because before I saw you, okay, I saw people looking at you. And so I didn't know who you were. I just saw your back, and I just saw the faces of these people when they came into your presence, and it was just like. So it gives me so I mean, I feel so blessed that I'm like the inaugural person. <laughs> it's something named after like the epitome of black girl magic. You go on, girl. Thank you. And there's so much of all sorts of magic in this room. And so thank you, Vermont. So I'm from the South Bronx in New York City, which is a low status community. And, and, and I was telling my, my new friend over here, Cody, um, that I don't really, I mean, poverty, I talk poverty or poor or underprivileged, I don't really use that to describe the kind of communities that, that I consider low status. And it's not like the people in them, there's something wrong with them. It's really just that from people both inside and, and, and outside the community, inequality is assumed. It's like a well-established fact. It's like there's something deep in terms of the structure of how those communities are perceived and treated that is consistent and happens a lot. And they could be from inner cities like me, like where I'm from. They could be from, from uh, Native American reservations. They could be, you know, all white you know, former Rust Belt towns that, you know, that used to have lots of industry and jobs and the jobs are no more. They're the places where inequality is assumed and treated, and those places and the people in them are treated that way. And so when I was so, and, and it also kind of serves to sort of create the policies in, in the way they're, they're it, everybody looks at them. So I grew up, you know, again, in the South Bronx in a, at a time when it was just like one of the many financial, you know, crises that, that, that this country's had, you know, since it um, happened about 400 years or so ago. Um, this one was in the 19, you know, 60s into 70s when there was so years of like financial disinvestment and redlining, in particular in urban communities where you could, where banks were, were literally redlining places where they were not going to put any kind of capital 
um, you know, mortgages, loans, et cetera, so for people could reinvest in those communities, whether they were businesses or homeowners. So, you know, the house that my dad moved into, from, from Georgia, by the way, Americus, um, uh, you know, was worth pretty much nothing. You know, he bought it in the 1940s, worth nothing in the, by the time I was coming up and born in the 1966. And so landlords were literally torching their own buildings to collect insurance money because there was no kind of real financial disinvestment coming in. And the Bronx was, in particular the South Bronx, was like the poster child of this. And, and literally it's like I saw it in the nightly news like every single night. And it was just kind of like, it was really jarring. And so, and so to see that, we lost like 60% of our population. Um, we had this, you know, it used to be a sort of like a thriving walk to work community, you know, because it was a you know, pretty like working class and, you know, uh, you know, community, but there were people that would walk to work because there was a light industrial section and people would walk to it. And then once that industry was gone because they couldn't yank any kind of, um, they couldn't like refinance their businesses or anything like that, People started, you know, that's when things like waste facilities started coming up in the community. And all of the, you know, the light and manufacturing industries were replaced by the kind of things that you see here. And I only came back to my community, but I use education to get out. You know, I went to, ended up going to the Bronx Science, uh, which is like a specialized public high school in the city, like one of the best in the country. And, and I know that there's a bunch of people here who actually have connections to that as well, but that's a whole other story. And, um, but I was just like, I was taught to measure success by how far you get away from those communities, from that community in particular, from any low status community. It is absolute brain drain. People like to think it only happens, you know, in communities like, you know, on the other side of the world. But no, it happens in American low status communities every single day. It is the exact opposite you know, of, what, of something that we actually borrowed a page from, you know, which is a talent retention strategy you know, that happens in companies. So in companies, they, if you hire people and you pour resources and benefits and you know, give them stock options or whatever, people, you, you do that because you want them to stay in your company. Like you, see, you help them see their personal success tied up in the business success. In American low status communities, we take the talented ones and we expect them to go. We give them reasons to do so because they're they led to believe that we will never create the kind of, of power, um, you know, personal, financial, uh, even spiritual gain within our own communities if we stay. So when I took a look at, at all this happening around me, you know, from like the shells of, bur of burning buildings, you know, to the fact that it was environmental burdens happening all the time, as a child, in my formative years, I was like, yeah, I'm getting out of here. And I did. But what was super interesting was that when I had to come back home and it felt like such a defeat, what was great was that education and the distance and everything that I had run away from but by the time I came back, it was that education and it was that distance that made me realize, like, wait a second, the reason why things are happening and the way they're happening in, in communities like mine is because we happen to be a low-income community of color and thus politically vulnerable. Oh. And the low status, you know, thinking didn't come until later, but I was like, but that's enough. And so I did, you know, recognize that our city wanted to build a huge waste facility on our waterfront. But I also knew that there were many amazing people in my own community who wanted beautiful things for their own community right where they were. And so I absolutely worked on helping to build a more sustainable solid waste management plan in the city, which I'm very proud of. But the thing that I'm most proud of is actually listening to my friends and my neighbors and going, how do we build something ooh, that actually creates more, what do we, so we know what we're fighting against, basically. What are we fighting for? And that's what really moved me. And because it was just like, we deserve a great place to live as well. And so as the city was planning on trying to build a huge, another huge waste facility on, an, on, our, on part of our waterfront, I got to work kind of thinking about, well, we, what, what else can we do? And so the, the dog that was, this was mentioned, it, it is a true story. So I was trying to figure out like, how do we create the kind of stickiness, the kind of community, what kind of projects can we do to make people happy? And so someone from the U.S. Forest Service literally contacted me and kept telling me about there's, oh, there's these, these, these programs um, that are there to support, uh, like tiny little seed grant programs for um, 
uh, to do restoration in, on, in American urban and threatened rivers. And I was like, oh, okay. And I didn't even know we had a river. I mean, I saw it, but it didn't look like anything. And I never really got close to it. And so, but during that time, that's when, um, you know, I had this crazy dog and literally she pulled me into what I thought was just another dump along our waterfront. And, but when I finally saw it, that's when I realized, oh my gosh, like this could be like a real change in our community. So I did, I got to work. This is what it looked like after like six or seven different um, uh, cleanups because this was before the age of camera phones and so we didn't take that many pictures, I kid you not. Um, but it didn't occur to me. Um, but now it's like, you just can't, I just, you just can't even imagine in the olden days. But anyway. Um, it's true. So, but anyway, what we did use, it was a little $10,000 seed grant. It really created, it basically, it bought lunch for some volunteers. It paid for some public art projects. And it got us to the point where th this little beta version of what we had was, was, was sort of like this little shiny thing. But again, we, what, because we didn't have the experience of even knowing what having a, a community park was, even though people would leave the neighborhood to go experience it, we didn't have the experience in the neighborhood. So what we had to do was really consider consider how to like create programming on a spot like that. And so we had like, we did music events, we did all sorts of, um, you know, canoe rides, we did, um, you know, boat building program, environmental stewardship stuff. It didn't matter what we did, it was just to get people down and help them see that there was a waterfront worth being on. And we also just did it as a way to kind of inspire folks to recognize that our community could be more, you know, than the sum of simply the way we were being perceived, you know, by, by folks from the outside. And this is still one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken. As you can see, I'm just posing. <laughs> Because I was, I was like, I am ready for my close up. I did a good job. <laughs> and, um, and so it was like, and they are here to like basically bestow $3 million to fix up this spot. And so um, at the groundbreaking, and we were able to transform that dump into this, which is the, the um, in, well, this is the beta version and into the Hunts Point Riverside Park as it exists right now. And, and it really did become this absolute sort of like sticky glue, you know, to folks in the community who like honestly like think it's been there forever. And I'm just like, yeah, okay, sure. You know, <laughs> because that's what you do. You make people think it's their idea and then they feel really attached to it. And I'm totally fine with that. So but but creating this this kind of you know, space, you know, that in a community that was literally like the poster child of everything that was wrong in urban area in, in urban America. And then having this kind of beauty so that people could see it literally reflected back on them was just one of the most incredible things. And yes, I was married in the park. Um, that dog became, was my flower girl. And, um, you know, because I have a bunch of nieces and nephews and this was not, I was just like, I'm not going to ask any of because it's just too much. It was like the dogs, the flower girl and the ring bearer. And they were all like, okay. So it was very cute. Um, but having something like that, you know, really made everybody feel like this is what you do. And so, yes, and we've actually won national awards for excellence in urban design. We actually beat out Millennial Park in, in Chicago for that one, I'm just saying. Um, so, but, but going back to this whole idea of like a talent retention strategy and how you know, low status communities are not considered the places where that happens, it's almost like, it's like when in a, for the academically or the athletically or artistically gifted people, it's almost as if it's like, oh, we've got gifted and talented programs for you. Oh, there's scholarships for you. There's like programs to get you and move you out because we see, we see you, we see your talent, but we do not expect you to keep it in your own community. And what is that about? And especially since I knew so many people in my own community that were awesome. And you know, they were you know, daycare providers, you know, they were entrepreneurs, they were medical professionals, they were actors, and they were, they were legal professionals. Um, this young lady, um, is a, her name is Noelle Santos, and she is a, uh, the, uh, the proprietess of the Lit Bar, which stands for literature and, 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 and lit like tipsy kind of thing. She combined her two great loves, wine and books, and has this wildly successful store in her, in her own community, um, which is really kind of cool. Um, if you follow food, um, uh, uh, Marcus Samuelson, who's in the top picture, is uh, you know he's a major chef, who has a whole bunch of places around. People love him to pieces. The young man in the middle is Christian Navarro, who's an actor who was in 13 Reasons Why, and he's still like you know rock, doing his thing. But when you ask people, young people, and you know especially in our community, which was a real 
really kind of fascinating thing because there have been more kids going to college simply over the last six or seven years and there have been in my neighborhood over the past 30. So there was like all sorts of love, you know, for, for the, the students, but we would ask them questions like, so what do you think about, um, when you think about what the community needs now, what do, you, what do you think? And they'd say things like, oh, well, we need more homeless shelters be, you know, or really low-income housing because everybody here is really poor, is going to get there. Um, you know, we need more health clinics because everybody's got like lifestyle, you know, related issues, diabetes, obesity, um, and, you know, things like that. And so, and we would, so we're, we knew, so you're good, statistically, you're going to graduate, go to college, um, get yourself a good career, are you planning to come back here? And they would physically recoil, physically. And it was just like, hmm, so, and so why? And they would say things, well, well, why would I come back to that? Like, I'm going to be successful. I don't want to be here, you know. And, and, we, you know, and they, I think, were responding to the way that, frankly, the nonprofit industrial complex, as well as our government, kind of treats our communities. And then the business community follows along. So, it's so we, it is almost as if poverty is a cultural attribute. Like, it's almost as if it's part of our DNA, quite frankly. And, 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 and they treat it in terms of the stuff that's in those communities if it's something worth preserving. So we ask people, in, as part of my practice as a real estate developer, I ask folks, so what are you looking for in terms of the, the community that you desire? You know, do you think poverty is a cultural attribute? And you couldn't say that because that's wonky, but you could ask them what you want, and they, they basically told us. They wanted the same daggone things that everybody in most communities would want, like a great place to live, play, and work with the kind of spaces that made them feel like it was a good place to be, period. The places that they would actually take whatever money they had and go somewhere else and enjoy it. But, so again, this was not, this was no surprise to me or to most of the folks that, that, that we ended up working with. But if you look at the way to the two kinds of real estate development that happens in low status communities, and it looks different in rural and urban sub suburban areas, obviously, but, but, but they kind of, you know the place, it's a low status community when you see it. And so like in an urban area, you know, things, so you know and the, two, the first kind of development is definitely gentrification and displacement, which I think everybody kind of knows what, what that's about. But for poverty level economic maintenance, you see things like instead of like diverse options for healthy food or even just like different types, you know, restaurants and things of that nature, well, instead what you see are things like, um, you know, uh, you know, greasy spoons, chain restaurants, cha chain, you know, chain fast food joints and things of that nature. Um, you know, if you have any other options to do shopping and for economic developments, you generally do because the quality of many of the places in our communities are not real great. Um, and you know, I'm a girl who loves a bargain as much as everybody else does. But com but you know, if you realize that your main retail establishment or dollar stores or 99 cent stores, after a while, you're kind of like, okay, enough already. Um, and you know the multi-billion dollar economic engine that is the pharmaceutical healthcare industry in this country absolutely gets a big portion of their balance sheet you know off of the backs of folks from low status communities because they there is you know more more the more lifestyle related health conditions in those communities that actually support the bottom lines of the pharm pharmaceutical industries because of the way our communities are planned designed and 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 treated um, and of course, there are plenty of ways to get self-medicated. You know, they dot the landscape as well. Um, if you want to save and invest your money, you, you, well, you got to take it to some other neighborhood because you won't really find banks or credit unions, but you will find things like you know pawn shops and check cashing stores, the kind of places that essentially do charge you for, to use your own money. And last but definitely not least, lots of very highly subsidized, um, you know. Uh, federally subsidized, you know, affordable housing, you know, for the lowest um, economic bands. And so some folks might say, and some folks actually have said, oh my God, but Jora Carter really hates poor people. No, that is absolutely not true. What I do have a big issue with is the fact that there are regulations and policies that concentrate poverty. And when that happens, what we do is concentrate and exacerbate all of the issues associated with poverty 
from low health, the low health education and attainment to um, low health outcomes and, and low educational attainment to you know higher rates of folks in, incarcerated, you know, higher rates of unemployment, you know all the kind of things that make people feel like they want to grow up and get out of the neighborhoods that they're in. These it's not quite a talent retention strategy, and but it's a really kind of like, like how do you repel the ones that you uh, that we you know are going to be able to do some things in, in their own lives. Because, but you don't expect them to come back to their communities. And but what's interesting, because we have been led to believe there's no value there. But just because we don't think that there's any value there, those of us born and raised in those communities, um, doesn't mean that others don't. Like these kind of signs that predatory speculators will put up, you know, offering to buy people's homes for cash. You know, the, 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 the solicitation phone calls, you know, that I certainly get like at least a couple times a week, you know, from folks who would just assume that I don't know the value, you know, in, the, in, in our land. Because again, when we're in it, we're led to believe that there isn't value in those places until they're, either, until they're gentrified or poverty level economic maintenance is being used as a way to enrich somebody else who's doing the, the development. And so, like this is one of my favorite, um, you know, Instagram posts because one said the woman who saw the post and we talked about taking it down literally said, um, you know, well, yeah, I, I literally have my daughter call, you know, the folks, um, you know, when they call and try to take my house for cash or or offer to take it and just say get away from my inheritance, which I'm like, that's what we should be telling our kids. So our approach to real estate development is a talent retention strategy. Um, it's all about creating a quality built and natural environment, um, you know, creating the kind of really commercially viable third spaces that make, that we know people leave our communities to experience because they want to be in places that make them feel good about where they are. Um, they want to feel like the communities that they're in is not sort of like, you know, has a community center that was added on by a developer that figured they should do something like that, but there are these like really organically fabulous places that are designed for them to be a part of. Um, and so the, we did, one of the first things that we did when we realized that nobody was going to try this, 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 this approach until we did it in my own neighborhood, because we are definitely a low status community, it has not been gentrified just yet. Um, so we decided to see what would happen if we actually built one of these things ourselves, one of these commercially viable third spaces that's neither work nor home, but creates an opportunity for people to gather and feel like they're good at gathering you know, together so they can see the beauty in each other. And so the Boogie Down Grind Cafe, which actually started off as a joint venture with a much larger uh, coffee, um, specialty coffee shop, um, we took it on all over all by ourselves at one point. And, but it's a hip hop themed coffee shop. It's, you know, it talks about all the early you know, days of hip hop, but really we did it because we wanted people to see themselves in each other. So it, it sort of got like sort of almost self authored you know, in terms of people being in the space and then deciding to do programmings, everything from open mics to, um, you know, um, art projects to things like um, credit repair workshops, again, all coming from the people that would go to this spot and realizing they're right, there aren't any other places in the neighborhood where you could actually do this kind of thing. So we offered up our space for folks to be able to do that. So it was a community center without being a community center because we had really good coffee and really good, you know, craft beer and all that kind of stuff. But it was so, but it was so interesting to me because I felt like, you know, what, what, and I didn't feel like it, I experienced, you know, what had happened was that there were other folks who really felt like there were so used to the idea that our communities almost didn't deserve the kind of things that other folks expected, you know, in their neighborhoods. And so we were, so it was really kind of interesting to me, even though like in, in coffee shops, because it's like the harbinger of gentrification, even though this one was 100% locally owned, it's still kind of just the idea that this is what happens before something, before, um, you know, we're pushed out. You know, we were actually protested. And, you know, we had like, it's a really crazy, you know, it was like, like 10 people outside with big banners. Yes, that is my name. Um, and, uh, you know, with bullhorns, screaming, all sorts of things about how awful I was and I'm gentrifying and I just, I don't really live in my neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was like kind of crazy, especially, you know, that inside that, that um, you know, inside the, the, the shop at the time, there were about 40 people assembled, the irony of it, 40 people assembled because um, they assembled because there was a workshop that was, that was um, promoting 0% interest loans for local homeowners so they wouldn't lose their homes and for aspiring and, and established small businesses as well. But again, if you're led to believe that there's no, no value in your neighborhood, then anything that doesn't look like it is just weird. 
and it's you just you put your hand up to stop. And so I do think it was like absolutely rooted in fear of just not understanding that there's that there's more than we could be in our own community because we are already more than than we're presented as being in our own community just because like the low establish, you know, stat, the the low status uh, system that the the nonprofit industrial complex looks at us and goes like, you, that place is super poor and that's the way it's always going to be. Don't make it so, you know, as as evidenced by like the many incredible talented people that literally we knew were leaving the neighborhood because their 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 goals and aspirations weren't being supported. So. Having more people you know, and, and recognizing that this space, and so I, I need to say that literally the day after we were protested, we had the best revenues we'd had at that cafe to date. Because people from the community, which was more of them, um, really understood that you know, the kind of thing, the people that were outside were not like representative of what people thought. And they were like, you know what, I didn't even come in because I don't even like coffee, but that was crazy, so I'm gonna buy some coffee from you. And then it, it literally actually helped us a lot. So I'm like, we should have another protest. Um, <laughs> but you know, that works well that way. This is another um, project that we're working on. Again, thinking about the way that the community, what we understand that the neighborhood leaves the community in order to experience, we were like, we need to build that infrastructure here. So this is a, a, a historic rail station designed by Cass Gilbert, the same architect that did the Woolworth building, and also the, um, you know, the U U.S. Supreme Court building, which Katanji's going to be in real soon. Um, Lord have mercy. And um, anyway, um, so but this is the same architect, and so it's like this cute little historic thing. It was abandoned for an, a, a number of years. We acquired it. You know, first thing we did was even before we actually, you know, our, my my John Hancock was like on the paper. Um, hired some young kids to actually do a little a mural arts project on it. And again, thinking about what people in the community, what we know they leave the neighborhood to experience, because all we really wanted to do with a talent retention strategy is really give people an opportunity to sort of see and give their communities a second look so that they could take their talent, their great positive example, and reinvest it in their own community, you know, economically, socially, emotionally, and spiritually, and do that in a way that it makes sense for them. So we decided to transform that space into an event hall. And, oh, and, and by the way, my dad, you know, from America's Georgia was a Pullman porter, and he took, and he basically just, you, actually won $15,000 in a horse race you know, when he was working the rails out in, 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 in LA, carried it, the cash, back home in a satchel, because then it was even harder for a black man to get a mortgage back then than it was than it is today. And um, literally plunked it down, you know, with the with a family that was that was willing to sell near this station, because that was actually his main line. And that's where I grew up. So that's my dad, you know, and um, you know, back in the day. And uh, it was a super it, so I just it just makes me very excited that his baby daughter, who I'm, I'm actually named after him as well, um, you know that I own a piece of a, of a piece of history that he gave to me. So that's the way I look at it. So thank you, Daddy. But this is what it looked like um, when it was first built, and you know we did the interior demolition and we did a little sneak peek of it. It's going through actually we're, it's going through a, a major renovation as it speaks, but we can still use it, you know, temporarily. And so last year we opened it up, did like a little pop up shop. Um, you know, for local vendors to come in and sell their wares, uh, which was super, super fun. And then in the evening, the actor Malik Yoba, who's a Bronx-born actor, um, who's now a real estate developer and also a, um, now he's a, a, a television director, did a series called I Build New York, and it was about, you know, uh, black and Latino, um, you know, other developers of color in New York City trying to get into the game. And so he premiered his, his uh, the, the, the series there with my, and because I was in the first episode, so it was kind of cool. And then after that, we did this, awesome you know show music showcase it was like both hip-hop and rock because we have like you know it was it it was the craziest evening and it was just like well past my bedtime but it was super super awesome but you know but this is the the transformation that it's we're going to be experiencing pretty soon and um, again we're using this as opportunities to create basically you know other opportunities for people to connect and um, and literally invest in the future development of their of my own community of their own community by doing our projects so we're using crowdfunding as a way to do that but this is this is a, a, like a really interesting spot because this seeing this building which my dad also worked there was a juvenile detention facility um, and uh, 
he, and it was this a terrible place. It was like written about in rap songs, Jay-Z talked about it. It, was like, it really was awful. We do not know how to do juvenile justice very well in this country, or much of it at all. But, um, we, but when it was finally you know, shut down because children's AIDS advocates and, 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 and uh, criminal justice advocates were just like, y'all need to stop this, they shut it down. And this five acre piece of land was just like sitting there like a ghoul and it was just like taking up so much space. And that's when I went to the, the second to last, you know, administra mayoral administration in New York City and was like, that piece, that piece of land could be used for something amazing. It's five acres big in New York City. That it should, let's think about mixed income housing, mixed use development, home ownership opportunities within this community and create the kind of mixed income housing so that the, the market rate folks can actually support a bunch of the, the local businesses so that they stay, but everybody gets the benefit from like really having a beautifully designed, you know, multi-income, you know, multi-multi-pronged multi place with home ownership as well. And so we thought about that, that program, you know, the uses and really like made like between mixed income housing, you know, lot, like looked at what the economic growth trends were, you know, got businesses who were interested in that kind of stuff to come you know, and wanted to locate it to, in New York to come, you know, got some of the best designers out there, created a vibrant, like, you know, commercial and retail opportunities that would happen there as well, you know, recognizing that this approach, this talent retention approach could literally be the, the difference between, you know, communities, you know, because this kind of topographical research, especially in American, post-industrial American cities where light manufacturing and residential residential stuff kind of like line up. People generally tend to know that in the area where they kind of meet, that hinge area, that's the place where like not a lot of good stuff happens. Like here where the jail was and the and the industrial area would meet, you know, residential and industrial. It was where everybody in the neighborhood knew because nothing else really happened there. We know that truckers would go and pick up a prostitute. But imagine if there was like, you know, you changed the ground plane. You know, you had light manufacturing with three separate shifts. You know, there were entrances to schools, to residences, to, to businesses, you know, along there. We knew that it would raise the bar for what would pass for, for economic development and real estate development in a low status community like the South Bronx and really create a whole other model for doing so. And we were super excited. Um, built like one of the most diverse teams, you know, racially and ethnically that New York City has ever seen on, on, a, on a real estate development project this big in New York City. And we had, so we built, we're planning on building 1,200 units of mixed income housing, including home ownership for low income folks in New York City. Um, and, you know, lots of light manufacturing would have ended up with like 800 jobs as a result of the new business development that we were bringing. And, um, you know, but the city decided to go this, you know, two mayoral administrations later decided to go with the same sort of status quo development, which was, you know, two all white male development teams. Um, and they ended up building a low-income housing project with no real economic development at all. Um, but there was a big health clinic, you know, and also lots of community centers. So I'd like to close with this because it's from Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. And, you know, he talked about the unavoidable impatience of actually thinking about a, and, and working toward, you know, a community that, and, and a country that was as good as its promise for everyone. And um, I it really felt that way that we don't need to move out of our neighborhood to live in a better one, you know, so much so that I did write a book about it. And, um, you know, really use it as an opportunity to, to share with folks, you know, my story and other stories about how we can help make that not just, you know, just like a cute little saying, but something for real that would really help repair and restore the fabric of America. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Majora. So thankful for your contribution and your wisdom, your knowledge, your hard work. We do have a Q and A, so um, uh, <laughs> and um, you know I didn't get a chance to speak after Wanda, but um, I do also need to acknowledge all the amazing uh, team in the Division of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion that uh, we've inherited. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank everybody from the diverse, uh, Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion that worked so hard on making uh, this symposium. Thank you all. Let's give them all a round of applause. Also.
Also, before we begin q and I want to remind you that we have one more keynote. My friend Cody Two Bears will be keynoting tomorrow, uh, and so please do uh, make sure to attend, whether in person or virtually. So we're going to do Q&A. We have mics in the front. For those who are not able to uh, uh, re reach physically to the, the mics, uh, Dr. Sherwood-Smith and uh, Sarah Mel from our team will make those mics available if you raise your hand. Otherwise, if you're able to come to the mics up front, uh, we will do a, a, a brief Q&A with Majora Carter. Thank you so much for just your passion and expression today of just such great, rich ideas. I'm curious, you talked about kind of how you ended up going home unexpectedly, mm -hmm. I think. Can you talk about kind of that process? What helped you eventually say, oh, I've, I've gone back home, and actually that's a really an yeah. amazing thing? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I went home because <laughs> um, I needed a cheap place to stay when I started graduate school. No, it, there literally, it was a huge defeat to have to go back home. But again, it really was the, the education that I'd had before that made me see things a lot more clearly. You know, and once you see things, you can't unsee them, right? And that's what I saw. I, I realized that it you know, wasn't just my community, it was plenty of other communities like all over, you know, and not just in, in, not just in this country, but internationally, like everywhere. It's like this is how you know, people are treated when they're considered you know, less than. And I couldn't not see that. And that's what made it like undeniable for me to, to say. I mean, I, I definitely think that was um, you know, such a huge blessing that I got. Hello, my name is Justin. I want to thank you for your presentation. And, um, you know, I, at the beginning, you mentioned a few other types of um, low status communities. And, you know, here in, uh, like, if we think about a lot of times how the, the mainstream media that we see and, and a lot of the messaging about low status communities, almost all of the images we see are urban areas yep. with predominantly people of color. Mm -hmm. Here in Vermont, there yep. are a lot of those low status communities, like when you said Rust Belt, you know, mm -hmm. that previously had industry and everything. There are some small towns with old empty textile buildings, yeah. and then there are some towns that don't even have that. Yep. And there are a lot of people that struggle with a lot of the same kinds of problems. Um, but a lot of times when we think uh, as a society about what it means to be progressive mm -hmm. and to make positive change, we always want to think about those communities in urban areas, right. predominantly people of color, for some reason we ignore right. um, those rural white communities in places like Vermont. Right. And so um, I love, by the way, your, your mention of, of how um, uh, you, uh, like there's this nonprofit industrial complex and everything that kind of encourages people, get away and keep that community poor. If you're good, get out so that it stays poor, right? But um, how do you think we can build a consciousness, yeah. especially with the overwhelming majority of students and, and staff and faculty here at UVM all coming from outside? Right. How do we build that consciousness where people are ready to think about those poor, rural, white communities here in Vermont? Right. Um, and I want everybody to take this the right way. But I really think that when that happens is when we really begin to, when we all understand the way that systemic racism has worked in this country. Because white people aren't doing so well either. Literally, like I, I was astonished to find out actually real stats about white people, um, things like there are way more poor white people in this country than there are people of color, period. 
So they're not doing that great. You know, biggest um, victims of gun violence in this country. It's not an inner city, not, not anywhere in the inner city. It's white men. But these are not the things because the, the tales, this is why I think people like to talk about poverty and problems as, as inner city, which, which, which is, just means black, right? And if, and if we like understood sort of like the underlying issues that literally only protect and preserve a very few people in this entire country, the rest of us will be like, what? Nah. But we're not there yet because we haven't really dealt seriously you know, with the issues around you know, how racism, in particular anti-blackness, you know, has created and underpins pretty much everything that happens here, every policy that's made. So that, that, that's it. Majora, we have a question from our, uh, one of our attendees online. And they're asking, during your quote unquote years away from the Bronx uh, at Wesleyan, were there any particular professors or courses that inspired you? Hmm. Um, yeah, Wesleyan was crazy. Um, <laughs> it was, and I don't think I really appreciated it un un until much later. There definitely were like individual uh, professors. Like in particular, I had a, uh, I was a film major. Like I have no background in anything I actually do right now. But I honestly believe that the, what I learned you know, in, in literally trying to, you know, paint another picture and present visions was something that I literally, that, that has taught me so much of everything, um, about everything that I do. So, and, and she, you know, and I didn't really know what I was doing, but like, I just knew I, I wanted to be creative and, and figured that I could tell some stories and, and she was one of the most amazing people like in my life and still is. Great, thank you so much for this talk. I, I really appreciate it. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about your experience with foundations. So talking about the nonprofit industrial complex and the way in which foundations have been so centrally located in that. Oh, yeah. And whether you also have seen any movement on the part of foundations in terms of how they're approaching this, how they're thinking about it, whether the kind of messages that you're talking about have in any way penetrated the programming that, that you're seeing out of foundations. I'm hoping I get like a call from somebody saying, you know what, you're right. <laughs> but um, I haven't heard it yet. I mean, the book's only been out for a month and a half, so I, I can't really complain. Um, but I mean, I was actually really moved. Um, this happened last year when I was actually, at, we're doing a, a pretty big project out in, in Indianapolis. And the, the Central Indianapolis uh, Community Foundation you know, prior to that, like did this whole thing where they actually acknowledge like they were white supremacist in their, in their giving. And it was just like, wow. And I'm not, you know, I haven't really followed it, but I just thought that was like, nobody acknowledges that. You know, but first you, you gotta, I mean, it's just like if we, if that's why it's like, if we can rest, you know, understand that, you know, how systemic racism and white supremacy is have literally informed the way we see and the way we, everything in our country operates, then philanthropy would be somebody that can do it too. Like I personally haven't like experienced it just yet, um, but I, at, you know, but I am hoping that it, that, that an acknowledgement, it's just sort of like a 12 step program. First you gotta acknowledge there's a problem and then you could do something about it. But I haven't seen like a bunch of folks, I hear people, hear people talking about it and like, you know, we're gonna make our best efforts, but I haven't really seen like, I'd like to see where the money flows. And I have, you know, it's like, I think for in this particular instance, it would be so awesome that, because I do believe that in particular big foundations can like stop the predatory speculation market if they wanted to. Like they could, they could literally be a holding company that bought the properties in those communities if people wanted to sell them, which would all it would do is they slow down, um, because right now predatory speculators, because they can offer fast cash deals and people buy. If foundations decided to use a bit of their corpus and then buy those properties so that uh, and hold on to them to give people time to get mortgages in those communities, that would help so much with generational wealth creation. But 
I don't know of anybody who's, who's done that just yet. Well, I think you'd be a very persuasive person, so you should, uh, you know, make the rounds. I hope <laughs> so. The doors. I hope so. Thank you. But if you know anybody, tell them to give me a call. So I'd we're going to try to bounce back and forth because we've got folks online. So mm. online and then back into the room. Okay. So the next question from our audience was, have you worked with any groups invested in food sovereignty in low status communities in the city? Um, have I worked with anybody who's in, invested in that? With any groups in, invested, it sounds like, in food sovereignty uh, in low uh, status communities. You know, it's, um, you know, straight up, one of the reasons why <laughs> I got protested is because I worked with some folks who, like many, some folks within the food sovereignty world in, in, in New York, in the South Bronx, like hate it. Um, you know, whereas I was actually looking on the side of production, not so much production, but distribution and, and actually manufacturing, um, you know, there were definitely folks, because it's harder to do food sovereignty. You're not, in an urban area like ours, you're not really going to grow enough food to feed your people. And as much as we'd like that, it's just not going to happen. And, and so our approach was just like, look, connect the people on the ground, you know, who are doing, you know, small lot food manufacturing and opportunities so that it can be sold by distribution, you know, places, then that would help them. And uh, I don't think people believed it. Um, so, yeah, so I do, I think that on the urban area, in urban areas in particular, it's super important to create more opportunities for folks to work on the ground, um, actually manufacturing food rather than it is to distribute and distributing it rather than trying to grow it. Um, but I have seen some really great stuff like in Indianapolis where they actually are doing some really good work on the ground, which I'm very excited to be a part of. Good afternoon. In the late 90s and the early 2000s, I, I worked for the New York State uh, Education Department, and mm -hmm. we were often at odds with the Board of Ed in the city. Of, Wait, you're at odds with, with whom? I'm sorry? You said you were at odds with who? In, in, in New York. Okay. Yeah. And so I spent a lot of time in, in the Bronx and the, and the Harlem and uh, other parts of the city um, trying to figure out how to, how to make the education system better there, dealing you know, with unlicensed teachers and all these types of things. But, and so perhaps the Board of Ed uh, fits in your definition of, of uh, part of the uh, nonprofit industrial complex, I don't know. But I'm curious what you think the work you're doing will, will do to help in terms of the education of the children. It, it feels like it's a, it's a loop, right? I mean, if, if there's something can stimulate different uh, different outcomes for students in those yeah. schools, then the neighborhoods hopefully could get better. But I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, what, no, I feel like the more opportunities with, for people, you know, to see different types of folks within their communities. Like one of the, I'll just, this, I think that hopefully this will help. Um, but I feel like one of the worst things you could say to me, you know, as a person from my own community, is, you know, that, I, that I'm not really from the community. And because there, I think there's often an assumption, you know, especially with, with young people, that uh, success doesn't stay in our communities. So it's almost like this, like, almost crazy sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that if you end up staying in a, in a low-status community, then it's somehow associated with you, so you get out. And if we're, in, and that's, a, that's the kind of messaging that I think we t continuously tell young people in our communities, because they don't get a chance to see you know, what success looks like because much of it moves out. And so if we're, you know, and so when you talk to educators about like half the problem is the environment that these kids are in, a lot of it has to do with the human capital that is being extracted in some way, shape, or form that doesn't give the kind of inspiration to, to young people to feel like, oh, I can grow up and do that. And not only can I grow up and do that, I can grow up and do that here. And, you know, again, seeing that play out all over the country, you know, in, in communities that, that I've worked in, it's like, that's really what kids want to see. Like, they want to see, like, hope and possibility, like, right where they are. And, and it gives them, a, you know, reasons to, like, want to stand up straighter where they are. And I feel like we don't 
do that in low status communities. Like if you're just constantly telling kids to go, you know, it's like you're smart, get out. Like, but what does that mean? What is that, how does that leave them? Because they grew up there, so there's this like constant craziness that goes on in your head. Like, you know, you, you know nobody cares about you. You know it. And you act accordingly, even when you're, or it, you, can, you internalize it, even if you don't act it on the outside, there's something that tells people, like, I'm less than, because this, look at, look at where I came from. Majora, um, that was an amazing talk. Thank you very much. Uh, very brief question. I, I don't know that the answer is brief, but how do we do this without a Majora? So how does this scale up? How do we do it across the country? You can't be everywhere. Um, I was wondering about the resilience of these kinds of things, right? So I, I don't know what COVID did to your experiment, uh, your, your effort here. Um, and so if you could speak to the resilience, but, but more importantly, the scale. Yeah, uh, what's, what's important is that you don't need a majora, you need a person from their community. You know, and, and, the one of, and the main reason why I wrote this book was because like, I wanted people to see that like, I, like my parents, and well, my parents have passed away, um, but like all my family and friends will tell you that there's really nothing that special about me. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I'm just a, a normal person and who just like saw the value in, in my own community and wanted to act accordingly. And what I have seen, you know, just, you know, just my own life, but also just with this book, it's this people going, wait a second, I, I see that too. Why can't I do something about it? And it doesn't have to be like huge anything, like I, but you have to, people have to start recognizing that they, that they can and that they are worthy. And the one wonderful thing is, is that the second they do, they do, and that's what's really cool about this, 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 this approach. It's just not listening to the voices inside your head telling you that your community and you, by association, are not worthy of love and respect and beautiful things. Thank you, we have one last question from Dr. Wanda Hedding Grant. Oh, I like it, <laughs> I like it. Um, I'm trying to figure out if this is a question or a, a statement, but maybe it's a combination of both. Um, curious, um, I've been doing um, a lot of reading and some of my work that I'm focused on around asset framing mm -hmm. and thinking about Trabian Shorter. And I love when you said, when you first came on, that you do not um, use certain language to describe um, folks. And um, now I'm thinking about um, Shoresh's um, comment and, and sort of, you know, building up. And what role do you see, you know, um, that the narrative model of asset framing, yeah. you know, that really starts with the great qualities of who these people are, who mm -hmm. we are, right. rather than going to the deficit part. And that, um, and that, you know, I believe contributes to exactly why folks want to get yeah, out. Totally. And don't want to go back. And so I was just wondering if you could speak to that because I think it's so important in terms of how um, many of us, if you're not careful, become gatekeepers and how you're describing right. a group of people to get your grants, you know, to get your money in different ways or, or to tell a story or a narrative. And, um, and it's so much to tell that is so good about people right. before, and yes, then they just happen to be from. Right, and even I, you know, when I talk about talent retention as a, as a strategy, it's because that's already here. Like, you don't see it, you know, in the narrative, you know, that the nonprofit world, our government often talks about those communities, but it's just like, you, like what are you talking about? Like, it's here, but we're not given, you know, so the, the, the assets are there, mm -hmm. but if we're not given an opportunity to, to, to help retain them, then I don't, nobody can blame them for wanting to go someplace else in their lives. But we do have the, the, the opportunities, I think, to sort of like set our sights a little more internal and that's why I was just like, I need to create some kind, and this is my research and development lab, my hometown, you know, but it's like, if I can show just a couple folks, like this is possible, then they'll do the rest. And they did, and they are, you know, just like, I, I can, 
it's, it's happening. And what else, the other thing that I did in the book was share that I'm not the only one who's out there doing it. There's plenty of folks like all over the country who are doing it within their own communities. And, and talking about it in, in ways that make sense for the, 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 the town or the area that they're in whether it's Alaska, you know, very rural area on a native, you know, in, on native lands, or, um, you know, in, in West Oakland, you know, or, or wherever. It doesn't really matter. The point is that folks have decided, like, you know, we have value and our lands do too, and we're going to act accordingly. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Do you get this? Oh, get to the mic? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for attending, both online and in person. Remember, 9 a.m. tomorrow, uh, Cody Two Bears from Standing Rock Reservation will be our keynote. Thank you so much, everyone.